listening to Transformation in Trials. Welcome to Transformation in Trials. This is a podcast exploring all things transformational in clinical trials. Nothing is off limits on the show, and we will have guests from the whole spectrum of the clinical trials community. And we're your hosts, Ivana and Sam. Today we have Philip Lundmessen in the studio with us. Uh, and Philip spent the last two years diving into the challenges in the clinical trial space. And Philip, could you tell us more about what you have uncovered? Yes, uh, thank you for having me uh, as well. Uh, really nice to be here. So I came a bit as an, I would say, an, an outsider to this space, right? I've uh, not spent a whole career in uh, in clinical trials, and you know, for 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 good and bad. <laughs> of course, I've had to learn a lot of the bread and butter. Uh, you know, coming in, but uh, but it also sometimes is nice to have an outside perspective on some of the dimensions. I think uh, one of the things you kind of um, immediately see is, you know, it's a very regulated space, of course, and, you know, for good reasons, right? We've had, you know, some quite some quite bad stories in the past of, uh, of clinical research, if you, if you go historically back. Um, so, so, you know, there are many good reasons for this regulation, but that, of course, also has implications on what you see. And one of the things that, you know, struck me a lot is we have, Oh, I've been surprised about the, you know the length of the timelines for new innovations, and it goes for you know the drugs themselves, if that's what you. But also just getting new things into this whole process. Um, that's at least one thing I've noticed. Um, and 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 one of the other things is that this is not just this. These delays are not just or these long timelines is not just the the rigor we have because of you know all the good reasons, but it's also sometimes delays. I think in the in the whole process that that kind of shows up, right? So you have. Um, many of the people I talk to talk about different different places along the journey of a, of a trial that, that delays can you know, show up. It's all the way from the beginning when you design a trial and you know take it to approval. That can be a, a pretty burdensome and 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 you know surprises can show up there. It's in partnering with the different sites that you want to do your trials with. Um, it's in finding the right patients for your trial. And then it's in trials becoming increasingly more complex for a various of other reasons in, in terms of, you know, monitoring and in terms of the endpoints you want to get out of your trials, which just means that, you know, more uh, control show up, more mistakes show up, and that can also kind of delay the trials. So I think those are some of the things, um, you know, that surprised me a bit that the, the course of delay is not just the rigor, it's also, you know, all the delays that show up and, you um, and that you know that's quite different from what you see and when you normally talk about you know technology companies that make you know many experiments every day on you know how can we change our products and so on it's a little bit harder in this space uh, and i don't think by the way it's the actress fault i think it's also you know partly it's the um it's also just you know the nature of this space right we've seen some of the big tech companies as well go into this space so <laughs> so it's not they all, they also have those problems but that was probably the biggest surprise to me that, that is very interesting that's a uh, we we have this story in our industry that it's because of all the regulation it's about all the compliance requirements that we need to live up to but that's not always the case sometimes it's just because it is complex uh, and complex time sometimes takes time yeah and i think you know what I also uncovered is that there's always a story, right? And there's always, you know, uh, always a different reason. So then it is, there's there's always a different story for, for why things go wrong and why, you know, they struggle to work with the specific IRB or, you know, they struggle to make a good negotiation with the site or it is... Um, uh, they they def define the patient population a little bit uh, a little bit off from what they thought, and that that just have very big implications for these trials later on. Um, uh, I think it's fascinating what you're describing, Philip. And I know that we've talked offline, but um, I'm sure you didn't just wake up one morning and decide to investigate clinical trials. Can you? No. How did you uncover these perspectives and yeah. and come across these um, these insights that you just shared? Um, yeah, so thank you. So, you know, I've been, I've long been looking for different industries, right? That's kind of like the nature of what I did uh, in my past as a cons consultant was looking at different industries. And one of the things I found really intriguing about, you know, the clinical trial space and, you know, healthcare more broadly is it has, you know, it serves a grand purpose for, for all of us, which is, which is something we, you know, we can all, I think, buy into to, to you know, help us all lead healthier lives and, you know, free us from 
from uh, disease and all kinds of other bad things. And, uh, and clinical research is, of course, a, you know, a very important part of this. And so, so there is, uh, you know, this obvious attraction of a societal problem that I think we, um, uh, those of us that are interested in this space, uh, you know, uh, really, really like. And then, you know, there is obviously also a big economical problem for the companies that, you know, monetize these uh, drugs or treatments or, you know, what, whatever they're doing, uh, that they are basically patenting their innovations, right? And when, whenever this process gets delayed, it is quite costly for their for their ability to recoup these investments they have made in in R and D. So so that's why I think it's a it's a very interesting space because it has both the purpose and also the the business challenges, so to say. And and Philip, uh, have you when you learned how the industry works in the clinical trial space? Did you uh, uh, talk to some of the people that you originally spoke to when you were uncovering how things work? and tell them some of your findings and how did they react? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I think it's, uh, you know, people react a little bit differently. And I think we all have this tendency to be a bit um, afraid of change, right? Or, you know, we don't we don't always like change. So when you come and propose new things or, you know, you have some findings and say, should we do it this other way? Um, there is, you know, naturally natural fear, fear of change in general and then when it's when it's compounded by this uh, tough regulatory environment that uh, that people are used to working in it, it you know for some people it becomes even worse uh, but but then again there are also you know many visionaries in this industry that have uh, that have seen some of the examples that already have taken taken place and have changed quite a lot right so, uh, in in decentralizing trials for instance and in, over the last couple of years is you know a big a big uh, driver, and once you've seen some of these examples and seen how it can improve, you know, a patient's experience, how it can lower the cost of running trials, how it can, uh, yeah, speed up the process, then, uh, then people, uh, you know, people that have seen that are usually more interested in exploring. And, and Philip, did you talk to a whole kind of range of different stakeholders here uh, from different functions within? The clinical trials paradigm, um, and uh, if so, did you hear similar things, or were there perhaps some common themes dependent on the type of stakeholder you were talking to? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there are definitely uh, common themes, but there are also uh, different uh, different stories. I mean, I, I came in. Um, probably not even really knowing what the roles are in a clinical trial, right? So I had to learn what a CRO is and what a, what a sponsor it and what a, what a site is and so on. So, you know, first you need to, to learn those basics and then you figure out, I probably need to talk to someone and all of these different, uh, all of these different stakeholders and, and a couple of other stakeholders as well. Um, and then you, then you see that, you know, it, there are some differences in, you know, in what they say, depending on where, you know, which type of agent you are. So when you talk to nurses at a site, right, they can be uh, a little bit frustrated with all these new requirements that suddenly end on their on their lap, or even the PIs um, and all this extra monitoring that you know happens these days that didn't happen in the past, and it's become so much more complicated to run a trial. And the trial is not really their main activity, right? It's just you know it's just a part of what they do. They are also doing research and more importantly, treating patients, right? So then they have this this one view of this, and then you can talk to a, then you can talk to a sponsor, uh, and they, you know, they have the, you know, have observed probably the similar thing, which is, you know, we are we are engaging this uh, this site, and they are helping us run this trial, and we know it's not their full time thing, but we also know they do a lot of mistakes, and uh, it's really hard to keep them engaged and motivated in our trial, and uh, and therefore we put in more monitoring, and you know. So they have the same problem, but they 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 see it from a bit of a different angle. So that that is at least one example. Just to break down what you did, you you went out to a number of different stakeholders across the the length and breadth of the uh, clinical trials landscape. Yeah, um, and I I guess didn't you give us some um, yeah so context as to what your methodologies around trying to um, dive into this topic? Yes. So my methodology has been, you know, of course, I reached out to a lot of different people and, you know, trying essentially just to, to understand, uh, you know, their, their journey first and how they see what, 
what is the journey of a trial from their perspective? What are the big pains they have? What are the big needs that they have to, in order to to uh, to make it a success for them? And then uh, you know, and then from there, patterns start to emerge. And then you know, some you end up having longer conversations with. We might even you know, some of them we are running proof of concepts with uh, for for different ideas that we are testing. Some of them we are just you know we're just interviewing and and may keep in touch with and talk to later. So, so that really depends, but it, it, I think it all starts with just trying to emphasize with the different users uh, and, and trying to understand, okay, so what are you actually trying to do and what problems are you facing in trying to do this uh, either with, you know, the structure of all or with some of the other stakeholders. And can, can you elaborate on any of those situations where you identified um, a problem and then the individuals that had that problem were open to solutions to the problem and what that looked like. I think one of the most frequent problems that you know I encountered is the problem of finding the right patient population and recruiting the patients. One of the problems that I saw most frequently was uh, finding finding patients, finding the right patients for your trial and making sure that the the patient, I think you even had a chat actually about this in one of your previous podcasts, right? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, representation in trials is, you know, it's a big thing, right? So making sure that you have a minority groups represented, making sure it's um, women are represented is a, is, a, is a big issue, right? L a lower social class is also a, a problem to get those exposed to trials. It's um, It can be a problem to have people that are both have like... Um, very severe conditions and less severe uh, conditions because you want obviously when you're especially when you're testing new uh, new drugs so when you're actually running trials then then it's, it can be quite important that you get uh, you don't just just treat the the worst example who shows up at the hospital but you actually get exposure to the to the um, less less severe conditions or maybe earlier in your in your in your disease journey um, so. You know, finding clever ways, for instance, to find patients that are not coming in to your uh, outpatient clinic um, and are already very, very ill, is is you know one area where I've seen you know quite a bit of interest and and you know willingness to to explore options. And Philip, you've uh, mentioned to me previously that you feel that there's a paradigm shift on the way in how patients engage with research in their diseases. Can you tell us more about this shift and what might hold it back? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, all trials are, of course, different, right? So it's, uh, you always got to be a little bit careful. But um, but in general, I think, you know, we see a broader change in society, which is, you know, uh, empowerment uh, of, you know, of all of us, right? And empowerment of patients as well, right? We would, we would all know that, if we if we go to the doctor, we have probably Googled our symptoms before we go, um, and um, you know, re resourceful people are, are very capable of finding trials that they might be able to participate in if they have a disease uh, now, and um, that creates a risk of bias, of course, in in the trials. Um, but but there is this like part of this uh, empower patients, you know, creates a trend of I would say in increased access almost for for patients uh, right and it's it's even uh, i think it's even strengthened we we talked a little bit about decentralized clinical trials right that one of the real strengths of that is it's become less burdensome for patients to take part so that's also you know increasing access in some sort of way and the other one is this you know ability to find and engage patients uh, from new channels not not just the not just the outpatient clinics and not just the posters but you know a host of other uh, clever ways of, of finding and engaging patients in uh, in trials. And it sounds like a lot of the methodology that you used while uncovering how clinical trials work uh, fits into this whole innovation way of working where you mm -hmm. uh, look at the users, figure out what their uh, pain points are, how do they work. Um, but I am curious, compared to other industries you've looked into, uh, in which ways is the pharmaceutical industry lagging behind those yeah um so that's a, i think it's not just lacking behind it's probably also ahead on many many parts right and other industries also differ so it's uh so but i think what you know one of the ones we we often compare ourselves to is is you know big tech right because they are kind of like a gold standard in many ways and many of the most successful companies are from from those industries so if we if we make a comparison to 
to that, I think, you know, the speed of adoption of technology is, you know, un, just a challenge. And we already talked a little bit about that, these, uh, these long innovation cycles, uh, partly driven by regulation and partly driven by just other types of delays in the process. Um, a lot is happening to be fair, right? Uh, you know, we have computer models for drug discovery, you know, kind of before the cl clinical trials uh, stage. We have also, uh, you know, examples of you know, like the preclinical uh, trial uh, space being being substituted maybe by by you know different kinds of models um, that that could you know substitute animal animal testing, so so that's really good and you know also of course later when we have like digital therapeutics I think is 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 a, is a big thing in our in our industry right so but we are like cracking the the clinical trials on humans part is is a little bit of a tougher cookie uh, to to innovate on and I think you know that there are some cool examples out there for. Uh, finding good pa patient populations with, you know, uh, yeah, with 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 algorithms that look through, uh, you know, huge amounts of data and, you know, can identify the right patients, for instance. Um, that That's a good example, but, you know, yeah, that, I think there's still some way to go as well. <laughs> and on that particular problem, Phil, that you, um, that you talk to in terms of patient recruitment, is that something that you're personally invested in now to, to find solutions for? Um, as a uh, as a as a personal project of yours or your organization, um, curious to hear if you've come across good solutions for that, or if it's something that you're working uh, towards trying to solve. Yeah, I think I think uh, finding patients for trial, as I as we talked about earlier when we talked about the journey, is one of the biggest pains, mm -hmm. and therefore naturally it is also one of the most interesting you know places to look for solutions. And uh, I think we have, uh, you know, we've seen interesting solutions, um, but I think, you know, a lot more can be done. I really like this, uh, this idea of, you know, yeah, we, we, we talk broadly about it, like, you know, we have these uh, empowering a patient, broadening the patient population, broadening the people you access uh, out. I have this idea of, you know, if we could get to a place where everyone with a condition can support finding a cure, I think that's a great vision to have and a great framework to put down on, you know, patient recruiting that, uh, of course, we need to do this in an ethical way, right? So we don't get back to those, uh, you know, um, yeah, those examples we talked about earlier from the 40s and so on, where people were forced into trials. That's that's not where we want to get to. But at the same time, we could we could normalize uh, being part of a trial in a, in a way that, you know, it would be natural for for anyone with a disease to to figure out if they you know could take part in helping and actually research shows that people are interested in taking part in trials they have generally good experiences when they're in trials and um, they they really like to contribute to 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 society and give back to the community that they are part of so um so i think it's interesting to explore opportunities in that area and we are looking into that with some of these proof of concepts we are we are working with me and uh, and the team is there anything further you can share on that with us or is it all top secret stuff yeah i think you know the uh the partners we're working with they are they have at least not allowed us to do so yet <laughs> so fair enough it's a good cliffhanger for yeah all yeah <laughs> <laughs> no. well that's a that's also a great segue to um maybe if uh if we're just talking about your imagination here, if you could design the perfect experience for a, a patient to participate in a clinical trial, how would that look? How would could we lower the barriers for them to to contribute? Yeah. So we can. There's probably a lot of things we can do, but I think overall, I think if trial options could be kind of integrated as as a potential way of of getting treated, I think that that's and there's probably many ways to do that but but that's the big that's a big hurdle right to integrate to integrate trials in the in the you know the normal care that we show either in the primary sector and the secondary sector uh, i think in some disease areas actually it is more um it is all it is already happening right especially you know we have if you have people with terminal illnesses that's kind of a natural thing to go to to trials or if you have uh, you know have disease areas where there are no no good treatments and uh, that it's more natural to go that way but we could 
with all these new, you know, new, uh, all this acceleration we have in drug discovery, um, you know, it, clinical trials easily becomes a bottleneck. And if we could integrate uh, the idea of trials and the trial options in a seamless way into treatment, I think that's that's really where we could get you know it to take off. I I really hear that loud and clear actually, Philip. And um, this is like completely left field, and I know it would never happen for regulatory reasons and uh, probably a ho whole host of other reasons. But things like organ donation in some countries that yes. is that is opt it you're opted in unless you proactively yes. opt out it's so, an opt out model yeah. right yeah and it's opt uh, yeah it's an opt out model so you're yeah. it's assumed you're opting in like is yeah. there is there a world where perhaps it's assumed you're opting in for i don't know maybe your data being used for a whole host of real yes. world type applications yes, yes. yeah that uh, yeah, I, I've had that, those thoughts as well. I think you know that's a great example because it's also you know sensitive health related. So I exactly used that example as well, which is um, it's so hard it's so hard to get people to support uh, organ dona donation, not because people don't want to, but because they actively need to opt in. Yeah, you got to do something. <laughs> yes, and it's it's a little bit the same problem we have with trials. Yeah. Um, and it's very few countries, by the way, I think that have managed to to go to the opt out models, <laughs> yeah. for, uh, even for organ donation, which is which is a lot more tangible, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so it will be it will be even harder to do something like that for for clinical trials. But it could also be less, right? It could it could be that you know at least we make a habit of asking people. Yeah, um, that could be a starting point. What, what about what about the role of kind of the whole digital landscape to? Um... Uh, facilitate this approach where I don't know where it's more assumed or it, we're, we're, we're making this part of the care pathway for patients whereby a clinical trial is just another component of their um, of their treatment pathway is is there a role for kind of digital tools and um, everything that comes with that to, to help facilitate this because the whole world's going digital right and uh, and with the, surely there must be opportunities there off the back of that yes for sure um i think yeah i think what you need to uh what you what you need to what you need to solve there is of course everything that is treatment related digital yeah. needs to be you know go through quite rigorous processes just like treatments that are not digital, and so if you want to integrate trials in that it it, it becomes it becomes part of that whole slow process it, it, in itself right, um, so, but I mean that that is the way we need to go uh, and. Um, and we need to find smart ways of getting, you know, people's consent to be exposed to trials as part of the as part of the main system. I think, uh, part of main being the the healthcare system, the the treatment system. Uh, yeah. Philips, in uh, you you're a fellow uh, dean of mine, um, and in in Denmark we pride ourselves with our uh, Medicon Valley. Um, concepts that kind of encompasses the Copenhagen area and southern Sweden. So yes. I'm, I'm curious if uh, how have you experienced the Medicon Valley startup vibe now that you're trying to to work in this space? No, I think uh, so far it's been great. Uh, as I said, you know, I still have a lot to learn and a lot of people to meet and, and learn from. But there is, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, health tech and biotech startups in the area that are you know, a lot of good funding opportunities and there are, there's a lot of research going on, right? A lot of the, both the big pharma companies, but actually also the public, public research, there's a lot happening in this area, which makes it, uh, which makes it very attractive if you're working with, with clinical trials or in general healthcare to, uh, to, um, to be in this area. And, uh, you know, so far I've only had good experience whenever I've reached out to people and, you know, asked them for sparring or help or, if they're interested in running a POC with, uh, on a particular idea. So I think that's a uh, big kudos to, to the environment here. And maybe that's a perfect segue to uh, to tell us more about your journey uh, to where you are today uh, and maybe also what you're what you're looking for and if our listeners could could help out. Yeah. So um, 
my journey, I have a background in economics. So, you know, quite far away from, uh, from the whole medical field initially. And then I, I worked, you know, in a number of years in, uh, in kind of strategy consulting, uh, starting with the very, um, you know, traditional strategy and M&A, and then, you know, gradually moving over to work more on innovation and, uh, you know, digitalizing. That's been a big, big topic uh, the last couple of years for a lot of companies and, uh, you know, big building digital units for different companies. And then, uh, yeah, transitioned here um, at, over the last couple of years into into uh, working more in clinical trial space and and uh, life science in general. And uh, you know where we are currently in the journey is uh, you know we are a small small team working and a little bit under the radar still, but uh, but working with a few proof of concepts um, on in this you know space. I think right now we're very very interested in in patient recruiting and you know how can we. How can we find good ways to find patients for trials? Um, and uh, you know, if you have that problem or interest in this space, I, you know, I'd love to I'd love to talk talk to you and 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 learn a bit about more uh, a bit more about your insights. Uh, also, happy always obviously to share what we have uh, what we have learned. And, and Philip, are you uh, are you approaching this as a consultancy or a, a tech vendor or a little bit of both um curious to hear. we are approaching it we are we have a plan of being becoming a tech vendor when uh, when these uh pocs hopefully materialize but uh, you know you should also be be ready to pivot of course right uh, that's kind of uh, one of the one of the mantras of uh, of this fa fast and agile is that you uh, you know you observe and then you see what the experiments say and and whatever they say they might they might force you in another direction so um, but it's not a plan to make this a uh, a life science consultancy although uh, i'll be happy to give some input if someone wants that's super cool i uh yeah. i love uh i think there's lots of room in this space for different innovative tech vendors solving lots of different niche problems so uh yeah great to have you as part of that and um Phil, where would our listeners be able to find you if uh, if they wanted to get in touch? Uh, if you want to uh, get in touch, I think the easiest would just be to write me a, a note on LinkedIn, and then we can uh, we can take it from there. I'm usually okay at responding. Um, we always ask our guests the same question uh, in this show, uh, and that is if you uh, if you had a magic wand that you could wave and change one thing in our industry, what would that be? Yeah, um, yeah. So you warned me a little bit about this question, so I had to do a thing. I think we 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 talked somewhat about it already. Um, I think you know, to me, it's really about making research more accessible uh, as a as a participant or as a contributor to the research, right? So we have uh, decentralized trials now that uh, decentralized elements and trials that allow for more remote participation. We have you know efforts to make uh, a representation better in studies, right? So we talked about the minority groups or the lower social class and um, and so on. We have, we also see like this, another, another element which plays into this, I think, is this increasing use of real world data. We, we didn't get to talk much about that, but that's of course also, you know, something that could feed into this making research more accessible, right? It doesn't, not everything we learn needs to come exactly from, from a clinical trial uh, in Denmark, we actually have a really good concept of we have very good registers for uh, for patient data uh, in Denmark, and there's a lot of trials that you know are based on that. So you basically just look into the registers and see, you know, well, how did this pa patient population develop, and you know, what happened to them, and that that's a great way of doing research as well, right? Uh, it's a even though it's not the the clinical trials, but but it's it's a great way of learning, um, and we have you know we have lots of data both in the uh, the electronic records that are kept uh, you know at hospitals and at uh, gps and so on in our devices and so on and uh, so you know, if you could imagine that some of this and you know you, you you mentioned it before uh, sam the kind of this uh, fusion almost of research and treatment in the future where if we could all be able to contribute our data to research in some sort of way um of course it needs to be an ethical way and i think this is where the um this is where the kind of opt out model is is a is a it's a fun example right another example that i've thought about is we see a lot of these like big institutions whether it's big companies or big hospital institutions that have you know huge amounts of data 
that they are very protective about uh, health related data from their from their research projects and they don't want to share it with each other but we you know we start to see these federated learning uh, learning models where you actually send the send the uh, the AI model around to the different data sets and train on the data sets and then you end up with a good model and you know at least one of the thinking I have is why don't why can't we all contribute to such a model right so we could all allow our own data to be available for that that would be kind of like the the gold standard and I think if we could we could all be part of such systems now it's just a big big data players but it could be uh, it could be much brighter uh, broader I, I had some I don't know if this is even the same context for it but I had something I remember something similar during the um height of the pandemic whereby uh there were opportunities I'm going to get this wrong now because I'm thinking on the spot but there the, uh, overnight you could uh, plug into an app and it would use the power of your phone um, to then power powerful algorithm, machine learning algorithms that were going on in the background um, ah. that were doing something to do with modeling related to COVID-19. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you heard about that, but you, in the morning, you could then have a look at the app and it would show you how many specific, I don't know what it was, but how how, how much time you managed to contribute towards this yeah. effort. I yeah. thought that was cool because it gave you the feedback loop of contributing to the greater good. Yes. Um, it was simplistic because yeah. all you did as the user was yeah. plug your phone in and, yeah. and let it run in the background. Uh, yes. Solutions like that to me are just no brainers because yeah. <laughs> very low power to entry and it just it solves it. Yeah. And there you're lending your computer power essentially to, yeah. to the uh, research, right? But you you also have examples where uh, in many countries uh, you, you have this app where you just, you know, lend your location uh, yeah. so that it's easier to trace you, right? And that's also, you know, in a sense, a way of fighting the fighting the diseases, not in a not in the research, but in 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 holding it back, so to say. So I think these. These broader con community contributions, uh, I guess, I guess is what it really is, and uh, and we could have that in research much more as well. I think. I, I think so. And like you talked about the 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 word ethical, and I I think that's it's an interesting topic ethics because I think it depends very much how you view it. Because mm. to, to me, I could potentially view it being non-ethical to not be able to open up my information and uh, data to be able to help greater mankind in a very philosophical type viewpoint so mm -hmm. i think like ethics is a huge topic and yeah. uh, how you use data is a massive topic but yes. i think uh, everybody should broaden their horizons in terms of what that actually means and think about it slightly differently um, yeah. for the greater good of uh, of humanity Yes, and we also see different perspectives on ethics, right? If you go yep. across the Atlantic, they are a bit more open and a bit more almost aggressive on the agenda than we are here in Europe, where we are very, very cautious. And we are. Know, sometimes that is good, and sometimes it just means that we get access to the, the cool stuff later. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's um, probably a whole nother podcast episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I really appreciate um, your input today for that. I think this has been a fascinating conversation. I, I'm personally very curious to see how uh, your um, POCs play out in the in the space and areas that you've been working in, and uh, what's going to happen next. So, hoping you'll agree to come and update our audience, um, maybe in a few a few episodes time or whatever it is that you're. Uh, you get the results from your POCs, and we can see what's next uh, for, for sure. your company. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. You're listening to Transformation in Trials. If you have suggestions for our guests for our show, write to hosts at transformationintrials.com. You can find more episodes in Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and the show notes are available at transformationintrials.buzzsprout.com. Thank you for listening.